welcome back to the Damage Report. I'm John Arula. Today being a Tuesday, you never know who you're gonna get. Mystery guests and all of that. We've got one that's uh, equal parts mysterious and awesome. <laughs> ben Dixon joins us on the show once again. How's it going, Ben? Going great, John. Good to be here as always. Uh, awesome to have you here. I joined you on your show uh, yesterday and we talked a little bit about impeachment. We're gonna have a little bit more on that, sort of a little bit of talk about the sixth. Um, how have things been going for you? I know that the country is in the grip of this massive winter storm. How are you uh, yeah. doing? Uh, we're doing pretty good. I mean, it is the coldest day of the year here in Atlanta, um, at least for me, I think. And um, last week it was like 70 degrees outside. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yay, climate change. Exactly. And, and meanwhile, I wore shorts to work today. <laughs> Should I have? I don't know. It's probably a bad decision, but you're able to in LA at the very least. So, but anyway, my heart does go out to the people who are currently suffering with this. The storm is absolutely terrible. And we are going to be talking about that at the close of this hour. So, um, everybody stay tuned for that. But throughout this hour, we're going to be talking about the commission that's going to be set up to look into the sixth, um, Republican efforts to rewrite what actually happened on sixth. It's going on every day. We're going to be keeping tabs on it. Uh, Mitch McConnell being thrown under a bus where wolves are waiting for him. So uh, that's fun to watch. And we've got other news too, including updates on the Lincoln Project. I'm sure it's good stuff. I'm sure it's great news for the Lincoln Project because they're awesome people with the best motivations. So that's gonna be fun too. But thank you to all of you who are already watching. Please hit the like button and uh, share the stream uh, if you're here. So that more people know that we're live. And as we go through this hour of news, if you send us chats and tweets and super chats and things like that, uh, we'll respond as we go. Oh, I also wanted to let you know, uh, once a month for our level three uh, members on YouTube, we do a live Q and A video that is coming up uh, this Thursday. And so you can go to the community tab, I believe. I'm just gonna start saying this and if I'm wrong, I'll get the notice. The community tab to post your questions. You can also do it live during it, but if you have any that you don't wanna forget, you can go to the community tab and post those. And uh, we'll be doing a little bit of chatting later on Thursday after the show. Uh, but with that, Ben, you wanna jump into this thing? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> so Trump is off the hook, but there are still a lot of questions about what happened on uh, in the Capitol on the 6th. Um, why was the security so unprepared? Were there tours being given? That was a thing that everybody seems to have just forgotten about. Um, but apparently there will be an investigation at least of some form. Uh, yesterday, Democratic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi announced that she's authorized a 9-11 style commission to further probe the events of that day as well as the various dynamics and actions that led up to it. Uh, she said this in a letter to protect our security. Our next step will be to establish an outside independent 9-11 type commission to quote, investigate and report on the facts and causes related to the January 6, 2021 domestic terror attack upon the United States Capitol complex and relating to the interference with the peaceful transfer of power, including facts and causes relating to the preparedness and response of the United States Capitol Police and other federal, state and local law enforcement in the national capital region. Uh, and then, yeah, they're gonna put together this sort of list of suggestions going forward. So Ben, they, they were past the trial already. The trial took like two and a half minutes and he's been acquitted. But now <laughs> there is gonna be this commission. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Are you excited to see this? What are your expectations? You know, I, I think this is a, actually a good move because you know it needs to be not only on the record um, of this country, what happened on the 6th, but I think in the a thorough review, needs to be put on the record, like uncover every stone. Like we need to understand what actually happened that day because of the scale of what happened. It was a direct threat to democracy. And so democracy is owed uh, some kind of report, a detailed accounting of what led to this. All of the players, all of the actors, everything is discoverable and they need to find out and put it on the record. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really gonna be interested to see what it looks like. I mean, they keep saying, 9-11 style commission, which I feel like, do you need to say that? Like, I, well, that's a weird thing yeah. to, especially with all of what came out of 9-11. Like, and I know that this isn't gonna be, like remember after 9-11, they had the Patriot Act ready to go after like 33 minutes. So <laughs> that was something they were already preparing. I'm not I'm not anticipating anything like that, but, but I wanna know what it's gonna look like. So we didn't get witnesses and sworn testimony during the trial. Are we gonna get that in this? Hmm. Are they gonna be, you know, are they gonna be talking to, um, you know, like Republican House leadership, like Kevin McCarthy, is he going to be talked to? Are they going to talk to Trump? Because, like, we didn't get Trump actually 
two impeachments go by and he doesn't ever have to actually testify. He didn't have to in the Mueller investigation either. I imagine they're not gonna talk to him. And if they're not even gonna talk to him, then then what is this really? Like, are we maybe gonna find out if any new Republican House members were involved? Like, are they gonna actually look at the tapes like that oddly they haven't so far? Because if they don't have Trump, I don't know what is expected to come out of this. Like another a couple more lieutenants with the Capitol Police will be asked to resign. Sure, and maybe that's even necessary, but like I don't care about that at this point. Like I feel like it has to go way deeper than that. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. And and there is the great potential that this would be an utter waste of time. Um, but they need to know that we're looking over their shoulders on this one, right? Somebody needs to be held accountable for what happened. And if we're not at the stage in America where we can hold the powerful accountable, where there's plenty of individuals who were in the melee, who are throwing fists, who are breaking windows, who are climbing fences. Like if you can't hold the powerful accountable, you need to hold these insurrectionists accountable because otherwise they're sending a message to the United States that insurrection is okay if you're a white conservative man or individual. Exactly. Yeah, or maybe Antifa in disguise. We mm -hmm. don't know for sure which it was yet at this point. <laughs> anyway, um, and we'll get to more of that. Yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I guess the positive is that. A lot of Democrats, rightly or wrongly, I know some people agree, some people disagree, um, that extending the trial would have been a distraction from other things. Mm -hmm. um, whether and whether it would be a distraction, they wouldn't be working on those things at the very least. In theory, this can be functioning at the same time as the COVID, you know, negotiations, which I guess are going to take like another four weeks or something like that. So I guess that's a benefit. But that also means that because it's not going to be front and center, it's possible that less people less people will be paying attention. And my fear, and we'll talk about this a bit more in our B block when we talk about Ron Johnson, is that like to us who to those of us who've been paying attention to what happened, um, we, we know what the six was about, why it yeah. happened, who participated in all that. But I am very curious to see a year from now, looking back, what will the average American think about it? How widespread will the conspiracy theories about it being Antifa or you know all of that be? I, I don't know. And I and I wonder any of these sorts of investigations, if they are really on the side and not a big focus, will they have the ability to actually inform what people take out of this period? Yeah, uh, you know, I think you're, what you're saying there is so is so critical. I, I feel like if there is no account here, right? If there's nothing that's going to be taken into account in terms of what actually happened, then it is a waste of time to the extent that there are so many other things that le the leadership of this country should be doing. But there is a great possibility that there can be some accountability put on the record. If we don't, then I fear what you're saying, John, is absolutely true. That we will be a year removed from this and we will be looking back and trying to figure out who it really was. Not as though you and I will forget of what it really mm -hmm. is. But if you look at how the Republicans are are spending it, they're playing the long game and they want to obfuscate the real situation. That's why I think we have to get it on the record. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. Well, you know, um, we, we've been talking about people trying to rewrite it. Why don't we move directly into that? <clears throat> Republican Senator Ron Johnson was on, uh, let's see, Milwaukee radio station WISN, and this is what he had to say about the Capitol attack. Well, one thing, and this will get me in trouble, but I don't care. Um, Again, I, I condemn what happened. I mean, it was, it was reprehensible. Never should have happened. But there were there were groups of agitators that, that were at the tip of the spear that caused that. Not not the tens of thousands of, of Trump supporters who would never even contemplate that. And quite honestly, the, where the video was edited, where people were helping police. Okay, mm -hmm. but the, the fact of the matter is, this didn't seem as an, like an armed insurrection to me. I mean, uh, armed, when you think here of armed, don't you think of firearms? Mm -hmm. here's, here's the questions I would have liked to ask. How many firearms were confiscated? How many shots were fired? I'm only aware of one, and I'll defend that law enforcement officer for, for taking that shot. It, it, it was a tragedy, okay? But I think there was only one. Mm -hmm. You know, if that was an, a, a planned arms direction, man, you, you're really a bunch of idiots. Ben, you know, you have to compare this to an abusive relationship, 
The easiest way to understand this is when a person is in trouble, they will genuflect, they would dance, they would do everything they can to spin it and turn it back on you. And this is what's happening. Republicans know that they are guilty. And so in order for them to never be held responsible, think of the abusive individual, whoever your significant individual was in your life that was abusive, this is what they're doing. They can spin, it is brilliant. He can spin on the dime and shift his position on from the angle in which he's arguing, right? Because in one instance, he's got to condemn gun violence. And then the next instance, he's now he's gonna support the police officer because he knows that resonates well with his base. They are brilliant, they are masterminds, and they are gaslighting the hell out of America. Yeah, 100%, yeah, 100% are. And you at least get with all of his little evasions, that mm. there's a little bit of worry about how Americans viewed that. Partly in that, you know, oh no, I condemn it. Obviously, I don't like it. Now let me go on to my main point, which is that <laughs> it's really not a big deal, everybody. <laughs> but then there's also the one potential landmine of uh, the cop was totally right. Whatever the cop did, whatever any <laughs> cop does, really is right. So that yeah. was right. But I mean, armed insurrection. Come on, I mean, it didn't succeed. And 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 this has to be pure speculation, but. If it had succeeded and they'd killed, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence and they destroyed the ballots and that had actually allowed Trump to declare a state of emergency and stay in office, would Ron Johnson mm. be opposing that? I'm not thinking so. I don't know for sure. But anyway, in terms of it, just the fact that they failed, okay, sure. Attempted murder is still a crime though. Intent matters. Like, do you remember the, the video that went viral of Ted Cruz? And he was trying to dribble basketball between his legs and he hit himself in the balls. He still <laughs> wanted to dribble between his legs. Bruised testicles don't mean that <laughs> intent doesn't matter. Just because you suck doesn't mean it doesn't count, Ted Cruz <laughs> or the insurrectionists. It really is really more about the insurrectionists. Right. It still matters. And by the way, Ron Johnson, they did have guns, okay? In court filings, officials have said that guns, bombs, stun guns, and other weapons were seized from rioters. 14 people faced charges related to bringing weapons to the riot, including an Alabama man who allegedly had an arsenal in his truck, and a Maryland man who police say stormed the Capitol with a gun, multiple magazines, and a bulletproof vest. There were people who brought Molotov cocktails. There were people who planted bombs. There were all sorts, if what you want are weapons, they had weapons for you. You have to do quite a bit of work to pretend that that wasn't there. And that is just about the only work that Ron Johnson is willing to do in this area. <laughs> no, you, you know, you're outlining it so, so perfectly because it's the disingenuousness of it all, right? There is no level to which these people will not go to lie. They know weapons were there, but if they have to say weapons weren't there, oh, no problem. Mm -hmm. They are equal into the task of telling every lie necessary for them to get away from being held responsible for this. Yeah. Well, we have a little bit more Ron Johnson. Why don't we roll that? I mean, we're, I'm sitting back in my office watching video of the of the uh, armed insurrectionists staying within the lines inside the Capitol. You know, they're not even venturing outside of the the roped areas, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm seeing a bunch of people milling about. Uh, I, you know, it right. wasn't until I really saw the video in the trial that you you really saw, the, you know, what what was happening and and how officers got got. Uh, Injured. Okay, so no, no, it should not have taken until the video in the trial. The whole country was watching on the sixth in real time, watching all of that. But so, so which is it? Because in this video, he's like, well, you know, I was, well, I was watching, and they were coloring within the lines or whatever. And then uh, during the trial, I saw this footage, which, by the way, didn't change your mind. You still voted to acquit Trump, and you would have not had the impeachment at all. Um, but you also still don't think it's an armed insurrection. So which was it that you saw this horrifying footage of them trying to tear cops limb from limb? Or it was just a couple of chuckleheads who got hopped up on, you know, like moonshine and just wandered <laughs> in where they won't weren't supposed to be. He really does want to play it every which way with this. Right. Right, right, and he's a master at it. And so is the majority of the Republican Party. They know how to do this on the term, at the turn of a dime. Like there's, there's, they can shift their argument in any direction necessary to never be held accountable. And to be honest with you, the only way you can get away from that type of gaslighting is we have to beat them. We literally are going to have to beat them at every single stop. We have to get super majorities because otherwise we're gonna be dancing around the fact that there's no limit to the gaslighting that they're willing to do to this country. Yeah, yeah, we need those super majorities to beat them, but we also need it to beat Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin. Like, 
Man, there's we have to win at so many levels to ever actually kind of win. <laughs> um, just I, I don't I don't want to hear his voice anymore. But so here's a little bit more of Ron Johnson from the radio show. That one guy in the Senate chamber had plastic wrist ties. What was he supposed to do? Go up to Mike Pence and capture him? It's absurd. He also said that he was literally never afraid during the riots and questioned whether lawmakers should have feared the mob. An armed insurrection? No, this was a breach. What? Breach castle walls, you breach bunkers. Breach <laughs> is bad. You you <laughs> suck at even like coming up with euphemisms. That's really <laughs> bad. It's not an insurrection. They just cracked the rib cage open and tore out the heart. No, that's still bad. That's a bad thing. And look at all of what he fit in there. What's he supposed to do? Go up and capture Mike Pence? Yes. They were chanting that that's what they wanted to do. They were pretty clear about that. They wanted to, sure, they wanted to wrist tie him. They also wanted to put something around his neck too, and that's a little bit more serious. And then of course they fit in a bit of the AOC was being hysterical. What an emotional woman to be afraid when lots of people were afraid. Nancy Mace was talking about how now she's gonna be packing heat when she goes to the Capitol because she was afraid. People were afraid, okay? They were rampaging through. They would have gladly killed any number of different politicians if they got in their hands on them. So Ron Johnson, again, as we've been saying, he's dancing around and he's playing, you know, like he's playing a whole bunch of games. But the end result is that he definitely wants you to come out of this experience thinking that the six wasn't a big deal. And mm. you sh certainly shouldn't be that mad at Trump or anyone else who contributed to it. John, you have to, I think if we, we need to really consider how far this country is willing to go to protect white supremacy, right? If you think had this been any other group, had this been leftists, had this been Black Lives Matter, had this been any group that is not sanctioned, basically white Christian men in this country, like Bill O'Reilly said, they would have gunned down every single person getting that close to the power structure of this country, right? But they are so willing to help and coddle and protect white supremacy that they let white supremacy go into places and threaten this leadership structure like we've never seen anybody else. Had this been any other group, we would have been yeah. obliterated before we got up the steps. Definitely, and in hindsight, even though it wasn't those groups, they are, like Lindsey Graham, like there's obviously there's what about is and all that about BLM and about the Capitol attacks. But Lindsey Graham is saying that because Kamala Harris bailed out some protester somewhere, he's not just saying that's kind of like inciting the mob. He's saying she should be impeached. He voted to acquit Trump, but he thinks Kamala Harris should be impeached, which is like what aboutism or both sidesism really doesn't encapsulate. It's normally intended to say, let's not have any standard whatsoever because lots of people do lots of things. Yeah. But he's saying we should have a harsher standard for the woman who bailed out some protester. If at a different protest with different people in a different state, a different month, something happened that I'm going to imply is like the capital attack, even though again, no politician actually encouraged this. It's really sick. It's like it's like both sidesism has gone super saiyan. It is way stronger <laughs> than the normal level that they do that. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a it's a whole new level, John. I've never seen anything like this where Lindsey Graham knows he knows full well what he's doing. And I and I think that these politicians think that nobody sees them or that yeah. nobody actually cares, but we see the lies. And you know, hey, that's all I should say. We see the lies, Lindsey. We see, we see, and we're cataloging, and thankfully some people are watching, but Trump did walk. We're gonna see, we're gonna see. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic, or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, 
aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Mitch, that picture of Mitch, that's who he is. That's who Mitch McConnell is right there. Anyway, Mitch McConnell implied in the run up to the vote on the conviction of Donald Trump that, hey, maybe he'll be reasonable. After all, he said that Republicans should vote their conscience. And he thinks, well, you know, I don't necessarily think it's constitutional, but I'm gonna keep an open mind. And of course, in the end, he voted to acquit. But he is speaking out a little bit against Trump. He wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that says, There is no question former President Trump bears moral responsibility. His supporters stormed the Capitol because of the unhinged falsehoods he shouted into the world's largest megaphone. His behavior during and after the chaos was also unconscionable, from attacking Vice President Mike Pence during the riot to praising the criminals after it ended. All of this, I think, is true. I've said very similar things. He goes on to say, I was as outraged as any member of Congress. That's not true. But senators take our own oaths. Our job wasn't to find some way, any way to inflict a punishment. The Senate's first and foundational duty was to protect the Constitution, which he takes very seriously. And he says the instant Donald Trump ceased being the president, he exited the Senate's jurisdiction. I respect senators who reached the opposite answer. What deserves no respect are claims that constitutional concerns are trivialities that courageous senators would have ignored. Our job was to defend the Constitution and respect its limits. That is what our acquittal delivered. So he will, Ben, he will speak out a little bit against Trump, but he takes the whole it's unconstitutional to impeach someone after they've left thing very seriously. And he really, really wants you to as well. What do you think? (laughs) You know, ignoring the decision of the Senate, number one, um, ignoring the fact that he's responsible for the reason, he's the reason why we're having to do this trial. After he left office, Mitch McConnell is that reason. Um, I'm really trying to understand whether or not Mitch McConnell believes that he can contain the monster that is Donald Trump. Because this is written like a person who's really confident that he can handle this internally. I don't think he realizes that Donald Trump is a cancer that is going to come to destroy everything Republicans ever stood for. And I'm actually okay with that. Yeah, I if if. Like, I mean, he had the opportunity, right? Like, if he was ever going to contain Trump, there was no better specific opportunity than convicting him and banning him from seeking office. I And I don't know for sure that he could have. It's possible that he looked into it. Could he have gotten an additional 10? Well, he would have been one. So an additional nine Republicans, yeah. maybe, maybe he could have, and, and he didn't. So does he actually want to contain him? Or is he signaling that he thinks that he doesn't need to be contained, which Mm. seems like madness too? Right, right. Either side of the coin. And and I was trying to figure, you know, that's the other possibility. But both of them are highly irresponsible for someone who, you know, they have an agenda, they have goals, they have they have their methodology, they have a method to their madness. I mean, they're illogical from our perspective, but they have a plan. And just taking their plan into consideration, Donald Trump lingering around the periphery and then coming coming headlong with his new media company and his new social media company and his 2024 campaign, he is mm-hmm. going to destroy the Republican Party. And they seem to be they seem to be okay with it. Yeah, and, and again, like we were saying during our break, Mitch McConnell, he's protected for six years, you know, um, and, and I'm I'm sure that's probably enough mm-hmm. from his point of view. He's gonna be a billion by then. Um but other Republicans in theory could go down either because of, you know, like Trump backed or QAnon, like official QAnon sponsored candidates, <laughs> or because, uh, you know, the Patriot Party runs a third party senator and makes it effectively impossible for Republicans to win anywhere. I don't know. Like these, from the point of view of Mitch McConnell, I would consider these, like if I'm trying to play devil's advocate and look from his point of view, these are serious threats. And he is responding as if he doesn't think that they are. And I get that he's been very successful getting what he wants in the Senate, but I feel like he's playing this wrong here. 
Yeah, he's overplaying his hand. Um, and and perhaps though, I think you might have be onto something. He could just be like, I'm out of here in six years anyway, so whatever. So he could have no plan Maybe. at all. He could just be in a chaos agent at this point. Maybe. And one other point I want to get to from his op-ed that we don't have a graphic for, but um, when he says we had to acquit him because it's unconstitutional to uh, impeach someone who's been out, even though they've impeached other officials that have been out of office, it, the whole thing is BS. Um, and even though he then goes on to say, you know, if it had been constitutional, then I would have had to seriously think about the case, implying that he didn't even do that. But then obviously the follow up to that is, but you are the guy that made it so that he was out of office. Oh, well, that's a call. Anyway, you, we could have had the trial back when he was president, but you delayed it. Well, in his op-ed, he says, well, I know that, that may seem like a serious response, but it's not about when the trial's initiated, it's when it's finished. And we could have never finished trial <laughs> during that time um, because they only had a week or whatever. Mm. If it had been a Supreme Court justice, I think they could have gotten it done in a week. And they were perfectly fine with having no no evidence beyond video, having no witnesses. So they're cool with rushing it if it's gonna result in him being acquitted. So what do you think about that? That people who are saying the only reason he's out of office when the trial is happening is Mitch McConnell's fault. Yeah. He doesn't like that attack either. Yeah, no, uh, he, of course he doesn't because he's trying to, you know, he's trying to just find a place to to find some footing. To just say anything so that he could just continue getting what he wants. Mitch McConnell here is is the utmost bad faith actor, and he is participating in a level of gaslighting that rivals uh, Johnson. I agree. I agree. To piggyback on George Carlin, it's bad faith and it's bad for you. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Mitch McConnell has been defending himself after his uh, comments that were critical of Donald Trump, uh, and bear in mind he voted to equip acquit Trump. But that has not protected him from the wrath of Republicans. In the pre-show today for TDR, I talked about how Matt Gates was attacking him, saying that Mitch McConnell's dangerous because he's been criticizing Donald Trump, even though again he voted to acquit him. Um, but it's not just him. We also have, uh, let's see, Sean Hannity. Let's see, this is what he had to say about Mitch McConnell. Let's make one thing clear, the seven Republican senators have voted to convict Donald Trump and other Republicans who have turned their backs on the former president are way out of touch with the base of their own party. Record 75 million Americans turned out for Donald Trump in November and they support him to this very day. Take a look right there. See that video? See what's on your screen? A few hours ago, spontaneously, thousands of people in Palm Beach, lined up in support of the former president as his motorcade traveled through Florida. Um, I have a question, Mitch McConnell, John Thune. How come you never had this kind of enthusiasm at any of your events? Okay, Ben, you first. I have a few points to make, but I want your thoughts about that. <laughs> okay, for well, the next four years. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to my boy Mundell for the best impersonation of Turtle McConnell. Um, <laughs> but what, let me tell you, let me tell you something. Republicans need to see that they have an emperor, and we all thought that emperor had no clothes. But apparently that emperor has everything that he needs to do whatever the hell he wants in this country. He has an entirety of Fox News backing him mm -hmm. and they refuse to hold him accountable. So now he can have these parades because he's a free man. Donald Trump mm -hmm. is a free man to do anything that he wants to do because nobody held him accountable. Congratulations, Mitch McConnell, you played yourself. Exactly, and by the way, I'm, I'm fine with him having um, the the parades if that's what he wants. If and that then that is what he wants. He is he just he just wants people to wave at him with a flag with his name on it. That's he's a simple person, but that does not mean that we get to pretend that it was spontaneous. Sean Hannity, even though Fox and Friends was saying that it's spontaneous, it was not planned. Uh, you can see that screenshot. It's not remotely true. It had been planned for more than a week because, of course, it was. People don't randomly just, <laughs> oh, there's people along the side of the road. Well, let me get my Trump flag and I'll join them. That's not how humans work. It was planned and people went. It's still impressive or whatever. They still went to literally wave at a car going by. Just be happy about that. You don't have to pretend that it was just word of mouth in a Publix that led to people going. 
Um, so anyway, that was one of my points. It's not spontaneous, Sean Handy. That sort of thing where you have to pretend that that just wherever he goes, <laughs> crowds form. That's North Korean dictator worship stuff. That so that's one issue. The other issue is in no universe again, and I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. The 74.23 million votes round up to 75. That's not how rounding works, you little baby. He got 74 million votes. That's pretty good too. Why can't you just be satisfied with that? And number three, we're and we're gonna have more substantive attacks against Mitch McConnell. This was sort of just the, the opening salvo with the where did you get the enthusiasm like this? Well, look, I don't like to speak up in defense, even a sort of hypothetical defense of Mitch McConnell. But Mitch McConnell won re-election. What about Trump? <laughs> Why didn't his crowd save him? <laughs> Mitch McConnell had no enthusiasm, and yet he won. I know that there's some questions about that election, and everything, but leaving that aside, he actually won. Trump had lots of rallies and lots of crowds, and he got his ass whooped by Sleepy Joe. So just bear that in mind, Sean Hannity. Your mouth, su- your mouth sucks, and you suck. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that part. <laughs> the last part, you know, he's talking a lot of cash money stuff, but um, Mitch McConnell won his race. Uh, John, I don't think I've clutched pearls that hard in a long time. Man. That was hilarious. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Well, okay, he does have more attacks against Mitch McConnell. So here's what Sean Hannity had to say. So this country are smart, they're not stupid. They can see the snap impeachment was nothing but political theater. No due process, no evidence, no defense, none of it. And now we're finding out that, oh, it was all pre-planned ahead of time. And another needless smear that accomplished nothing. It's been five years of this. They've also had it with Republicans and Democratic swamp creatures. Um, and this is a question the Republicans are now gonna have to ask themselves tonight. Where was John Thune and Mitch McConnell fighting against the biggest abuse of power corruption scandal in our history with Operation Crossfire Hurricane. They were missing in action. Where is the sanctimonious Mitch McConnell, John Thune demanding that Kamala Harris, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, when is he going to give a speech on the Senate floor and hold those Democrats accountable for their incitement of insurrection and their insurrection-like language? The time is now coming for new leadership in the US Senate. So that's the big line, new leadership. He doesn't want Mitch McConnell anymore. And Sean Hannity still has a big audience. Most of them are asleep and elderly, but he does have an audience. So what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I, I'm just, um, these people cannot gaslight their significant others to this extent. And so they get on <laughs> national TV and gaslight America because everything that he just said was a lie. And he's a prolific lie. He is a master of lies and half truths. And they are doing a. John, how do we like? We're fighting against some really malevolent people. Like this is mm-hmm. this is downright pure evil in a certain extent. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, he the crossfire hurricane. Like I I know there's a memo coming. I'm sure, and a memo is gonna prove everything about how Obama <laughs> tapped his things and was looking at his text messages and and touched his ass. I don't know. Like <laughs> there's always something coming, Sean Hannity. This is this is what his audience tunes in for. So you know, I'm not gonna knock the hustle. This is this is his grift or whatever. But um, and so the fact that Mitch McConnell didn't like protect him from crossfire hurricane, which I think is a board game that I played growing up. I'm pretty sure it was an 80s board game. Um, it's just it's just such nonsense, it's such nonsense. And then the Democrats were the ones who inspired insurrection. Which, which insurrection did they, they just won the election. That's the normal thing. That's not the insurrection, that's just the rection, I think. You were <laughs> insuring, you were the ones who tried to steal it. And um, anyway. All of that is just grifty frosting on the cake. The cake is they're pissed at McConnell because McConnell isn't being um, deferential enough to Donald Trump, even though McConnell has given him virtually everything that Trump has ever asked for. He gave him all those judges, Sean Hannity, how quick to forget about the judges that you got and all of that. Mm. And again, McConnell voted to acquit Trump. Mm. So. Um, like the main reason that I want to uh, that I want to mention this is one is that there is a chance this actually leads to new leadership for the Republicans. I don't know how likely that is, but the other is that Mitch McConnell like really thought, and and this is to one of your earlier points, Ben, that he was being really slick, um, and he thought he could have his cake and eat it too mm. or whatever. And yet 
he voted to acquit him. He's still getting attacked. The you know the 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 Trumpists still despise him after all of this. I don't know how much that matters, but he is leaving this seemingly in a weaker position than people like not just Trump, but Marjorie Taylor Greene from the point of view of his base. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I I have to think about this kind of from a Star Trek perspective. Just give me one second on it, like the mirror universe, like the 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 Spock with the beard. We have to look at the Republican Party as a mirror of all the problems that we have on the left. And you have people who actually look at Mitch McConnell and think that he's too reasonable, right? Yeah. You have Sean Hannity, who is, we, they have their extremists on Fox News. Ours are on Twitter, right? And they have a bullhorn so loud that they're able to shout their extremism across to millions of people every single day. And that extremism believes that Mitch McConnell, who just acquitted Donald Trump in the January 6th incident, they look at him as too reasonable. That's a problem. We have a serious problem in this country. That's crazy. Yeah, and and they think that at the same time, they think that Biden is an insane communist that's going to hunt down all of his political opponents when Biden has no interest in any of that. Like he you could stab Biden in the kidneys and he'd be looking like to like reconcile with you after 5 minutes. Like <laughs> it's just it's madness <laughs> what they they gaslight them like at the end of the day they gaslight themselves like right. Sean Hannity now dwells in an insane world and his view of virtually everyone figures on his side of the aisle and the other side he cannot rationally look at them like he doesn't know what they are or at the very least he has to lie about it to his audience we can you know we can always debate to what extent they're true believers or they're just lying Sean Hannity seems like he believes a lot of this right. um but anyway, that's not Mitch McConnell is a Mitch McConnell is a radical. He spent last year just exclusively trying to stop people from getting COVID aid and getting a Supreme Court. That's all he did. Um, mm. And that isn't enough for people like Sean Hannity. It's mm. crazy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, really fast, let's jump into this. Virtually all of the Republican senators of the seven who voted to convict Trump. Many of them have been censured by their state parties, which I think is a great form of cancel culture. But anyway, it's allowed because they're on the right. Um, some in speaking out against these senators are really revealing themselves. So I wanna show you this short video. This is Washington County, Pennsylvania County GOP official Dave Ball and what he had to say about Republican Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, we did not send him there to vote his conscience. We did not send him there to uh, do the right thing or whatever he said he was doing. We sent him there to represent us. Sometimes they're really honest. Like, like to do the right thing or be a moral person or <laughs> not condemn yourselves to a lifetime of nightmares about your regrets. Like, <laughs> they, they really are feeling they mean business, man. They are serious about this. They don't care that they, they know they're lying. They don't care. Lying is just a tool to, for survival for them. And they're, they're in survival mode right now. And so they'll do anything, everything. They don't care what they have to lie about, still cheat. I mean, drop bombs on, it, it doesn't matter because they're in survival mode. And you gotta understand what they feel like they're losing is power because Democrat Joe Biden won. Listen. Nat Turner didn't win, right? Fred Hampton didn't win. The revolutionaries don't win. We get killed, right? Joe Biden won, and they're yeah. acting like it was a full-on declaration of war. Yeah, like we we had to sit through Bernie losing twice, and they're acting as if we're on top of the world. Yeah. We're not on top of the world. We're a little bit happier, maybe. <laughs> we're not anyway. Yeah. Um, we're not. We didn't send him there to to vote with his conscience. We vote, <laughs> send him there to represent us. Which even that that's that's not. Tr I mean, I guess sort of. You kind of want to be represented, but mainly it's you're supposed to be there to do whatever it is that Trump wants and to never criticize him. Um, there was a very similar sort of argument in a tweet form from Marjorie Green, who was attacking. I forget the Republican representative who had revealed the information about Kevin McCarthy's call with Donald Trump on the sixth. And she had a whole tweet that was basically just saying, uh, stop snitching. It was, they're tattling to the press, they're gonna throw them under the bus. All this stuff 
That means she doesn't like that congressman, but does not mean that congressman woman is lying or is revealing something untrue or dishonest. They just don't like that it's revealed. They're not interested in the truth of the six coming out. They're interested in Donald Trump being protected. So if you're a Republican and you have extremely damaging information, you need to hide that because the truth is subservient to whatever Trump wants. And Marjorie Greene is a simple creature, so she reveals that blatantly in her tweets. This guy in his quote, Dave Ball, reveals that no, this isn't about you being a Republican senator, a hardcore conservative, by the way. This isn't about you exercising any sort of independent judgment. You are only as good to us as you are good to Donald Trump. Um, and he he's not running for re-election, Pat Toomey. In 2022, he's gonna be gone, so he doesn't really care about this. But this strain of the party is still gonna be there. And I don't know in a few more election cycles what's what's gonna be left. Like, is Matt Gates gonna be the reasonable person in comparison to all these new people? I, I don't know. I don't know what's coming for them. This is the creeping, I, I don't even know how to categorize this, but this is the slippery slope of fascism, right? Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene is able to say these absurd things publicly now because, well, we've been become desensitized to it after four years of Donald Trump's madness, right? But, but there's an escalation, and we've seen this escalation in real time since the Tea Party. Yeah. We've been sliding into this fascism for a very long time, and we cannot continue to negotiate with these ideological domestic terrorists. Yeah, yeah, the the Tea Party stuff now by comparison seems <laughs> like they were doing cosplay too, but it wasn't the Q Q Don Shaman guy or whatever. <laughs> and of course, most of that was entirely dishonest. They they all acted as if they just cared about the deficit and they wanted to dress like Benjamin Franklin, but it was really it was anger about Barack Obama daring to be elected. But mm. anyway, Throughout last year, the post office was very effectively destroyed by some of the goons that Donald Trump put in charge of that. Unfortunately, the chief goon, Louis DeJoy, is still there and is still planning yet more damage to the post office. So the new plan is to raise postal rates and eliminate first class mail deliveries, moves that are likely to lead to slower mail and higher costs passed on to customers, according to reports. The potential cutbacks to first class mail, which includes letters, bills, and other mail sent to local addresses, would eliminate two day deliveries and instead lump that mail into current three and five day tiers, the same as non local mail. So, wow, I had not really thought, I thought that he would sort of try to lay low a little bit and maintain control of the post office to protect the damage they've already done for as long as possible. But Ben, he's not doing that. He's planning yet more, like eliminating entire classifications of mail. That is a bold move for someone who, in theory at least, although not directly, could be removed in the future by Biden. You know, I, um, it's, it's actually dawning on me. This might be the real play here, right? Because if you think about the, if if you think of a cohesive strategy from the Republican Party, it is one thing: destroy the efficacy of the government, right? I mean, I mean, we could reduce everything down to that, and what is left but the post office. So, it I couldn't understand it through any other lens other than I think that's the play. Because if you get rid of the post office, then you really don't have a justification. In, in their mind for a collectivism government. Yeah. Yeah, and and definitely like they spent most of last year terrified about what mail like uh, increased mail voting uh, could be like. They demonized it, they put it into joy and all of that. Mm. Well, I mean, it definitely seemed to lead to more voting, so if they were afraid of it, their fears have been concern can have been confirmed. Yeah. And we know that there's legislation pending in a bunch of different states to roll back voting rights. Mail voting is a big part of that. But in the meantime, if they can either increase or just protect the gains they've already made in disrupting the ability of, of widespread mail in voting to happen, I think they're gonna find that very appealing. Yeah. And I wanna give people a few numbers from this. So he didn't release 2021 on time delivery data, but December numbers made public in lawsuits show that only about 40% of first class mail was arriving on time down from about 92% the year before, which is just madness. Like, how can you still have your position when, like best case scenario, you didn't do it on purpose, you're just terrible. You're the worst at your job imaginable. We know that that's like not likely to be the actual truth, that this is a result of the changes that he made. So we don't know exactly what's happened in January. 
But it, have we had any reason to believe that those numbers have become much better? Or that the changes that he's um, planning to roll out, where they're not even gonna aim for two day shipping anymore, that that's suddenly gonna result in mail being delivered faster? It, it really does seem like he's being quite successful from the Republican point of view. Ah, it's Trojan horse. I think that Mick Jagger comment was about the Trojan horse of that manager, right? We could tie that into this. This is a the Trojan horse of the Republican Party, right? What they're what they're doing is this is a hostile takeover. We have a board that is here, like the Republican Party. They know they don't know anything else. They know how to destroy companies, and now they're coming in to destroy this country. And Louis DeJoy is 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 actually executing this on a on a masterful level because he understands if it's the slow boiling of the frog, man, like. Yeah. If, they, if we stay in this kind of situation over the next four years, their next move is not going to be so so ridiculous in our eyes because we would have gotten used to it gradually. So, yeah, and and so then why hasn't anything been done? Because um, Biden can't just remove DeJoy, right? But he could appoint a Democratic majority board that could then fire the Postmaster General. But he hasn't done that. Mm. Why hasn't he done? I mean, even if you ignore the political implications of the, the uh-huh. changes to the mail, um, people still need the mail. Like, so why haven't they done anything? I get that there are some other things they're doing, but he he hasn't been remotely involved in impeachment and doesn't want to be. I mean, the COVID negotiations are ongoing. Is Biden spending eight hours a day doing that? Like these sorts of gaps where it, it would be so easy for them to act and he's not doing it. You really have to wonder. Why in this case? I can't imagine that he approves of the changes and yet the result of his inaction is that they're more likely to actually go through. I think it's because they trust in the process more than they're willing to look at the problem. Right, the problem is a problem that's rooted in greed, individualism, and white supremacy. Right, and it requires significant changes because the Republican Party has mastered the art of breaking the system as needed to maintain power. And I think Joe Biden and the Democratic Party really believe in the system when the solution is changing the system because the Republicans have shown they have no problem with breaking it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And uh, I mean, all like. The result of all of that electoral activity in the last year was to reverse as much of this as possible. Right. You don't like just sit by the wayside and let them continue to do this damage for as long as possible. Okay, let's move on to very different news. <clears throat> it has not been a good period. It has not been a good period for the Lincoln Project. A multiple of their co-founders have stepped down over the past few months, um, and. In particular, Lincoln Project co-founder John Weaver has been revealed to have been sexually harassing more than a dozen men. Some are saying up to 21 different men, some of them involved with the Lincoln Project over the course of a couple of years. Well, that was bad enough, but now we're finding out as a result of some of their employees being released from non-disclosure agreements that they had previously been bound by, that the Lincoln Project management might have known about that sexual harassment, that like campaign of sexual harassment for a very long time indeed. Several of those released said that Sarah Lenti, a managing partner with the group, who was previously its executive director, knew about the allegations against Weaver as early as May 2020. Lenti confirmed that some of the group's co-founders knew about the allegations as early as March 2020. Steve Schmidt and co-founder Reed Galen were among those who knew, according to multiple sources. Now, if you're not familiar with the Lincoln Project, it was launched in late 2019, so you know a couple months before they found out about the sexual harassment, by a group of high profile Republicans with the mission to defeat Donald Trump. It went on to raise nearly $90 million, more than half of which flowed to firms controlled by its various founders. Um, so Ben, are these not the heroes we've been led to believe? <laughs> Listen folks, uh, just a couple of things on this one, John. Um, they've got all the money. They drained. They they took all the money from the nice, mean, well-meaning liberals. Um, guys, you know you you have poured money into an institution that has no regard for even common decency. Okay, um, I know they made good ads, but all of us can make good ads. Okay, mm-hmm. check out Stand Up Georgia. Just a, a shameless plug, <laughs> right? You know you poured millions of dollars into this organization and you poured it into the bad guys because they have no qualm about using your money to live a lifestyle that the rest of us are like. Quite frankly, John, like none of us. 
if we know that we can't afford to be high flying and, and, and in the limelight and live certain lifestyles. Like we have to live a level of transparency in what we do because you know we're all fearful of the letter that the FBI sent to Martin Luther King. So we gotta keep our noses clean. These people are out here, I mean, they're taking your donations and just living any kind of life they want. You poured your money into the bad guys. Can you pour your money into the good guys for a change? Yeah, that, and apparently the money existed. Um, like, yeah, ninety million dollars. <laughs> they made they made some ads that were entertaining. Um, studies show that the ads didn't really have much of a persuasive effect at all. <laughs> that the money would have been much better used in a lot of different ways. But uh, yeah, I and and it's it's a great grift, really. And it's not to say that they don't actually hate Donald Trump. I'm sure that they do. Obviously, George Conway is not a fan of Donald Trump. I get that, but they were able to succeed in raising that money partially because the ads uh, went like a bunch of them went viral. But also because they could always say we're Republicans. Mm. And we see a lot more of that in the opposite way. You'll have people who will go on like Fox News and claim yep. to be former leftists or former <laughs> liberals, or you'll have a woman whose whole thing is saying that women shouldn't vote or something like that. Mm. And that's really appealing because it like as much as you like people like you telling you what you want to hear, you really want the enemy to have been won over and now tell you what you want to hear. And so mm -hmm. that's supposed to be on the right. Having the mm -hmm. Lincoln Project come in and do it to like centrists or liberals or whatever, I, we should have known better. These are still really bad people who's mm. and not just the sexual harassment. The sexual harassment is obviously abhorrent. But every one of those Republicans has supported horrible policy and still will in the future, <laughs> just not with Donald Trump as the figurehead of the party that's going to be passing these terrible policies. I, I, I've got a solution. I got. I have a solution oh, because solution? how do you? How do you? How do these well-meaning liberals really know if they're dealing with someone who's going to operate in good faith in terms of humanity and push? You know, like you, they want it. You're right, John. They wanted to believe that these Republicans from Lincoln Project really saw the light. I'm reminded of what my homeboy Marcus Farrell always says about if there's somebody's really progressive, ask them where they stand on reparations. Ask them where they stand. Matter of fact, ask yourselves how where you stand on reparations first. Then ask these Republicans, and then you will find out that it really starts breaking down and falling apart because the excuses that they would go through to oppose that will really expose the fact that they were never in your category or your ally to begin with. Exactly. Exactly. And and again, the ads were entertaining, and last year was rough, and we all wanted to see great videos and stuff like that. I get it. But now we can move on, I hope. I hope all of us can move on. People who already sort of knew who the Lincoln Project was, those who might have been fans of them up until this most recent news. And we do kind of need to move on because despite the fact that a lot of their founders have moved on, they're currently planning, or at least were until this reporting, to expand into media and international political consulting. First of all, <laughs> what place do they have? Advising politicians in Morocco or Thailand on how to run campaigns. Trump isn't running there. Um, but also just media. Like they're talking, like they want to be, you know, Vice or Vox or whatever. They want to be like doing an HBO show and all the it's, you did some commercials, okay? The campaign is over. The the like you got $90 million. How is that not enough? Like how much would actually be enough for you to be satisfied? I guess <laughs> I guess a lot more. A yeah. lot, lot more. Yeah, greed is never satisfied. Greed is never satisfied. Yeah, it almost makes me want to get millions so that I can know what it's like. You know, I think it'd be a great social experiment. Oh, I think I should them. become a millionaire. <laughs> hey, you know, put your money into the hands of people who would reject greed. Watch what I would do with a billion dollars. Like, I there, there's got to be a rule: nothing over nine hundred ninety-nine million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand. That that every <laughs> dollar over a billion we donate to charity. Every dollar over a billion should be taxed at 400%. thousand <laughs> percent. That'll teach you. <laughs> anyway, that's not how it works at all. Okay, uh, really fast, we're gonna we're gonna move into a, a darker topic and close out uh, this hour with just a few minutes we have left. Throughout America, this winter storm has been absolutely devastating. Although in some areas far worse than others, and really disparate areas. Areas so in the east. Um, you know, you have over 20 dead as of this morning. God only knows now. Um, as a result of these storms, Texas in particular is being very hard hit. Nearly 4 million homes and businesses continue to be without power in Texas 
this morning. After temperatures dipped below zero, North Texas shattered a previous record low on Tuesday morning after dropping to a temperature of negative two degrees at Dallas Fort Worth International Airport. And if you're international or if you're not, you know, like from around Texas or whatever, this is not normal at all, these sorts of temperatures, or certainly not for the past 100 years, basically. That's how rare it is. And as of right now, the state's energy and government officials are facing intense scrutiny as millions of Texans are left without power and face unusually cold temperatures in the single and negative digits. At least 11 people have died just in that state, including, and this is really tragic, a woman and a girl who died as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning after sheltering in their car in a garage to keep warm. And that is how bad it is. It was the state is just not prepared for temperatures this low and it's led to rolling blackouts and rolling makes it seem as if you lose power for a little bit. There are people who've had a couple of hours of power over the last few days amidst freezing temperatures in houses that are not designed to deal with freezing temperatures. So Ben, it has been absolutely devastating. Yeah, and and the tragedy, the human life. I mean, that's the the deepest tragedy here, right? These are these are families that are broken now, loved ones, and 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 it's because we are not prepared for what is increasing in intensity and frequency, right? We have once in a year pandemic, and now we have once in a year cold snap in in northern Texas, and. The thing is, is that these occurrences are increasing in, at a level that shows us we need to be prepared. And we need to take these things seriously because when we're not prepared, real lives are taken away from us. Exactly, exactly. And you know, once a year, horrific wildfires ravaging you know California. Once a year, like there's a lot of once a years that are happening yeah. and they're devastating. And they are reminders, all of them, that we need to stick together and that we need a competent government. We need competent local, state and national governments to deal with these situations, to get help to people who need it. Whether it's in Texas or Florida or California or the Northeast or wherever. Um, and some people in government who could be a part of that competent government need to understand that these are not, these are things that can affect anyone anywhere. Texas politicians should not need to be reminded that horrible situations can hit them. We've had horrible hurricanes hit Texas in just the last few years, but memories are short. And so just briefly, let's remind a few of these politicians that when they were like, you know, dunking on California and other states for their natural disasters and saying that somehow this is this is California's fault, national government doesn't need to deal with it. Well, no, it's always like we spin the circle of cruelty and some state gets hit pretty much every few months. So, you know, back when Tech when Ted Cruz was tweeting about California saying it's now unable to perform even basic functions of civilization like having reliable electricity, Biden Harris AOC want to make California's failed energy policy the standard nationwide. Hope you don't like air conditioning. Well, yeah, it does it is bad, Ted Cruz, when you can't get power to your citizens. And they're potentially dying from the weather. That is a bad thing. And it doesn't just hit California. Or Dan Patrick, who tweeted, this is what happens when the Democrats are left in charge. Why California's liberal climate policies are causing electricity blackouts. Or Attorney General Ken Paxton, California's politicians did this, not the heat. Okay, well then did Texas's politicians do this, not the cold? Is that how it worked? Or is it that sometimes nature is a real bitch? And we mm. need to do something about it. Mm. Anyway, Save really us. fast, this, this, these tweets were put together by Brandon Friedman, a columnist for the New York Daily News, who attached this photo. And if it's not clear from the photo, that is a block of ice in his tub. But he unfortunately lives in a state where politicians believe that the role of a politician is to own the libs, not to protect your citizens from horrific weather events. Mm. That's gonna be it for today's show. Sorry about ending on a down note. Uh, but Ben Dixon, as always, we love having you on. Um, uh, you. There's gonna be a lot of people in the audience right now that are wanting to know where they can watch more of your content. So where can they? They can go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show or check me out right here on YouTube. Awesome. Ben, as always, thank you so much. Pleasure. Just a couple of weeks ago, new President Joe Biden announced that they would be ending support, US support 
for offensive operations in the UAE Saudi war on Yemen. This is something that a lot of activists have been doing a lot of work to try to move the US towards for years now. So seems like good news, but is it all it's cracked up to be? How is this actually gonna work? Well, we're very lucky to be joined once again on the program by the legislative manager for Middle East policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Son of Tayyip, welcome back to the damage report. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, glad to have you back on. We've talked about this topic um, several times over the past couple of years. It, this looks pretty good. When you saw this announcement, um, how did you how did you respond to it? Well, thank you for that question, and thank you for covering Yemen. It's not something a lot of uh, media outlets are doing these days, and I just really appreciate it. Uh, so I was overjoyed that something that we've been lobbying on for three, four years or so finally came to fruition. You know, there's, you know, I'm gonna get into some of the questions we have, but I wanted to take a moment to breathe and celebrate and celebrate the activism that went into making this happen. I don't give you know full credit to the Biden administration or even you know House Democrats or Senate Democrats. This was really the grassroots and Yemeni activists around the country, humanitarians, you know grassroots activists all over and great journalists really put the pressure to make this happen. Now, what happened is the Biden administration said they're going to end US military support for offensive operations in the Saudi UAE led war in Yemen and offensive weapons as well. So the big question is what does that really mean in practice? Uh, you know, does we originally got into the war on a defensive mission to support Saudi Arabia, and that defensive support went into supporting airstrikes on Yemen. So we have to be really careful. Uh, luckily, there are members in Congress right now that are trying to get those questions answered, and that's what activists like myself and others in our coalition are doing: is trying to get clarity and also clarity on what weapons does. You know what weapons are offensive. You know we just mm -hmm. announced a massive weapon sale to the UAE and the lame duck of the Trump administration, and some of those weapons were F-35s or drones. Are those going to be included? We don't know yet. Lastly, we don't know of any military support for the blockade. You know how this is going to impact that as well. So all yeah. key questions we need to keep pressuring them to get. Yeah, and it seems like there's probably a few related things. There's changes to our policy specifically having to do with with Yemen, and then overall, it does seem like they are dialing back the just insane levels of weapons sales and um, you know jets and things like that from the past few years that, in theory, could be used in that conflict. Um, that seems like a pretty big change for the region as a whole, and not just with Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis. -vis Yemen, although as you point out, we really do have to see the US has a long history of this sort of support. It's gonna be interesting to see if Biden is actually willing to significantly cut back our military involvement with Saudi Arabia. I don't know what your level of expectations for that are. I know that you're you're sort of expressing cautious optimism. I guess I'm wondering, and it's impossible to say, what's the distribution of caution and optimism there? That's that's a you know the thirty-six billion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I think we got to keep pressure on Biden, but we can't forget about Congress here. Congress can legislate an end to all of this military support and all of these weapon sales. So we cannot forget about con the Congress's role in this whole question and keeping that pressure on members of Congress to put pressure on the Biden administration is I think how we're gonna get to a good place. And I, I do have cautious optimism. We can work with the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act this year to legislate a permanent end to this, to this war and military support. Um, now, another thing that we didn't mention is restoring humanitarian aid. And I do wanna touch on that a bit because in March 2020, the, the Trump administration announced a suspension of all humanitarian assistance to Northern Yemen where the Houthis are. And 
that's 70% of the country's 30 million population, a massive amount of people were basically cut off from humanitarian assistance from USAID. So that's another thing that we're trying to press on the administration in a very short time frame, you know, because that aid is needed. There are 16 million people living on the brink of famine in Yemen right now. So on top of the military support, which which I think we're making some good progress there, we need some clarity still, but we can't forget about the humanitarian aid. You know, I'd actually like to, because it's been a bit since we spoke, and the time between our last speaking and now has been hardly a situation that's been easy on a lot of the world vis a vis the pandemic and all of that. What does the actual situation look like in Yemen? I mean, back before the pandemic, there was famine, there were cholera outbreaks, there was the widespread destruction of infrastructure and medical facilities. How is Yemen actually faring more recently? Yeah, it's a really important question. Uh, I have sobering news. The UN just made an announcement that they fear 2 million children could, are at risk of malnutrition and death uh, in 2021 if conditions stay the same. There are 16 million people living on the brink of famine. Cholera remains a major issue in the country. And because of the war, 50% of the healthcare facilities have either been completely destroyed or are partially functional because of airstrikes and because of fighting. And when you've got COVID-19, an outbreak of COVID-19 in the country, that's you know it's one of the most fatal places in the world for the coronavirus. When you have that situation, it's just absolutely devastating. And unfortunately, the United States is completely complicit because we've been supporting a Saudi UAE led coalition airstrikes and mm-hmm. you know giving intel sharing, logistical support, these spare parts transfers, which keep these Saudi warplanes in the air. Um, so it's, it's a really devastating situation. The other thing I wanted to mention is the blockade is still in effect. And you know, unfortunately, the way the blockade works is sometimes the Saudi coalition allows in food, you know, sometimes they don't. Uh, most recently, they've been choking off the flow of fuel, which has really reduced the capacity of hospitals as they're trying to, you know, take care of people through this uh, terrible pandemic and humanitarian crisis. So that's another piece that we can't forget. So you you were talking earlier about the distinction between uh, offensive support for the war, defensive support, and how we we don't know entirely. What's in column A, what's in column B, the logistics and the intelligence sharing that you talked about, is that a defensive use? Um, and I'm curious if, if, as you say, we watch and it looks like the, the promises to cut back support aren't going far enough, aren't as substantive um, as activists might hope for. Do you think that it might come to a, a reinvocation of the War Powers Act that they tried to do under Trump, that something like that, an effort or at least the threat of that, might be necessary to to put further pressure on Joe Biden? I think it's certainly something that we should keep on the table. I mean, I, 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 it's gonna be a little bit more difficult politically right now to invoke the War Powers Act on the Hill. Um, and you know, just for the sake that Democrats don't wanna force uh, the administration's hand. But I've heard members say that they are willing and are open to doing this. And I think that's a really good sign. And mm-hmm. beyond just the War Powers Act, like I said before, we still have things like the National Defense Authorization Act, where we can slip a provision in there to completely and permanently end US military support for the for the war on Yemen, um, and also you know cut off weapon sales. So we've got some other vehicles besides the War Powers Act, and you know I I think we have to keep all options on the table. Uh, like I said, I am cautiously optimistic. It seems like you know the pressure that the activist community in the U.S. has built up over time is uh, really strong, and and you know we have the ear of members of Congress. The conversations I'm having now on the Hill are completely different than the conversations I was having four years ago on the Hill. So I just definitely wanted to lift that point up. Okay, well that that's very good news. Um, finally. It's obviously it's it's been a goal to stop the U.S. directly contributing to this horrible situation, but let let's say that perhaps that's successful and Joe Biden does pull back from that. Is the next step to have the U.S. exert diplomatic pressure, economic pressure, to try to end the hostilities and and try to fix the situation in Yemen? Like if we're successful in the, in in the U.S. pulling out of this, what are the next steps? John, that's probably you know 
if not one of the most important questions, if not the most important question, is how do we reach a diplomatic settlement in Yemen and finally end the suffering? You know, ending US military complicity is a huge part of that. You know, I cannot overstate that. But yeah, you know, an interesting thing to bring up is that the, the Biden administration announced that Tim Lenderking would be US envoy to Yemen to help secure a uh, ceasefire deal and work with the UN uh, led peace process. So I think that's really critical. And it shows that the Biden administration is, you know, really making a commitment to a successful peace process. I think we need to follow the lead of the UN because the US has really lost a lot of cre- credibility because we've been supporting mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, one side of the, uh, you know, one side of the conflict, but also really important. Um, I think we need to. This is something I've been bringing up to members of Congress and folks on the Hill and with the administration is that we really need a new UN Security Council resolution because the original one that was passed and and you know you know agreed to in 2015. You know, was all against the Houthis. You know, said we have to stop weapons to the Houthis, but didn't really bring in uh, the Hadi government or the Saudi UAE-led coalition. So it's really unbalanced. And mm-hmm. Senator Murphy brought this up in a nomination hearing with Linda Thomas Greenfield. So folks are definitely talking about it. We need a new, more balanced UN Security Council resolution. Um, and, and on top of all that, the U.S. needs to use its leverage with Gulf allies, and you know folks around the world to put pressure on the Saudi UAE led coalition to you know end their offensive operations uh, end the blockade restore and expand humanitarian assistance and you know and I think yeah we've got a lot of work to do a lot of people are suffering where you know the, just because we end our support doesn't mean the war is going to magically be over but we're taking some yeah. initial really important steps well, that is certainly good. Even that opportunity being open is certainly an improvement on the last few times that we've talked about this topic. So I want to thank you once again for joining us and for your work and hope that those conversations you're having in, in DC are, are fruitful. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the Young Turks coverage of this over the years. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.